researcher based in Eastern Europe. Wait a second. Uh, full screen again. <laughs> okay, so uh, I just said I was based in Eastern Europe, Romania, and I will present my current research and thoughts on a case study regarding the pigeon feeding in urban space and focusing on how sociology and in this case vegan sociology can help in understanding this case. So uh, to, to summarize my framework, it's a critical animal studies framework. It especially comes from post, uh, post-humanist and anti-speciesist thinking. And I will be using, I used qualitative research methods. Basically, I, I looked at the public debate that ensured uh, after the interdiction of public feeding of pigeons in the city of Timisoara, Romania. So I will just explain a little bit what I did, but before that I will give a context, a history of our multi-species relations with pigeons, uh, and, and then, then conclude with possible visions. Okay, so the context, um, just to begin broadly, uh, I will be talking specifically about this proposed interdiction of public feeding of birds in Timisoara, which was put up for debate and legislated this spring in 2021. Although such interdictions are happening, all, have already been happening all around the world. So Timisoara is the capital city of Timish County and the main economic, social and cultural center in Western Romania. And in 2020, it elected a new mayor from a liberal progressive party who came with some ecological promises. And also Timisoara is proposed to be the European capital of culture in 2023. So I think this, these are important uh, things to be mentioned as a context for the proposed modifications of the city regulations, because these modifications regard uh, animals in general, not just birds. Um, so they were already in the works in early 2021, uh, and they led to two amendments that sparked the discontent and the public debate. And the two amendments that people really didn't agree with and they asked to be debated was first an interdiction of feeding birds and animals in the public domain. Uh, and ultimately the animals, uh, the other animals parts was left out. So what actually happened was only the interdiction of feeding birds in the public domain. And second, the thing they really didn't agree with was the limit on the number of companion animals in a household if neighbors are bothered. So only if neighbors complain, not, not otherwise. So first of all, um, the, the thing about b feeding birds in public spaces is that everybody actually was talking about pigeons, not other birds. So I try to look and, and try to conceptualize how did we end up here with having um, so many uh, pigeons live in urban spaces and having the humans who live there don't not want them there. So feral pigeons are descendants of domesticated rock doves, which are their wild counterparts, so to say. Humans domesticated rock doves a very long time ago, as featured pigeons are found through Mesopotamian terracotal models. Their long breeding season made them into fertility symbols, but it also made them useful for domestication. And throughout history, pigeons have been bred and used for food, communication, entertainment, and science, all in the service of certain human interests. So their history is very much intertwined with ours. Our pigeon, pigeons were over time even war heroes. They were symbols of the elite and even associated with working class hobbies. So if we look at feral pigeons, they're in a sense, they're already uh, having, they already resisted part of uh, human domination because they, in a sense, are escapees of their domesticated counterparts. We can maybe look at them as fugitives, and but it is also possible that they evolved by breeding with both their domesticated and their wild counterparts. So they are really these complex beings with complex histories that navigate our very complex urban spaces. And it is where they live, where they reproduce, thrive, survive, or die. And yet many people in urban spaces have increasingly found them undesirable. And uh, cities have tried to get rid of them, controlling the pigeon population, often in very violent ways. So in his studies on how pigeons became social problems, Colin Jerolnak examines how pigeons end up to be seen as out of place and even uh, public problems again. And this is done a lot by strengthening the nature culture boundary, but also through a growing imaginary of a clean sanitized city. So Jerolnak writes that, I quote, 
uh, claim makers have not only redefined pigeons, they have redefined space. Pigeons are now a homeless species. The past century has redefined an ever increasing number of spaces as off limits to them and other animals until there seems nowhere where humans live that is considered legitimate for pigeon. So in this public debate that, that ensured after the interdiction, it was a debate within, uh, between the officials, between citizens and between invited experts. From the very beginning, we were given a frame from which to think through this problem. And the framework is that pigeons are said to be too many and population control measures are said to be useless without an interdiction on public feeding. So such an interdiction of feeding is already common practice uh, in European cities such as Venice, Flores, pa Paris, Vienna and London. And in Romania, it's already been taken up by Oradia, Bucharest, Deva and Slatina. And the officials uh, really underline this, this the, the fact that it's already common practice. So obviously the assumptions between this is that the cities are primarily uh, human spaces that humans should decide how many pigeons there should be in a city. And according to such a decision, they should reduce the population. And, and these are obviously very anthropocentric and speciesist assumptions. So uh, the official who proposed the interdiction came with uh, five, what he called common arguments, which are presented as well known for why pigeons should not be fed in public spaces. And the first one that he went with was pigeon welfare. Uh, this is because current uh, feeding practices are considered unhealthy for pigeons because there's a lot of bread and carbohydrates. The second one was that pigeons attract rats. This is uh, given absolutely no other explanation. As Colin Jerolmach has already written, I quote, so ingrained is this truth that the character and threat of rats is not discussed. So we just, rats are just considered so undesirable that this is not even something that needs to be explained. Uh, three, pigeons destroy the nests of other birds. So I find I found this one really peculiar because there is not much evidence for this and it's not very often used. Uh, the fourth one was pigeons are disease carriers. This is one of the most often used claims, although it has been disapproved over and over in the sense that pigeons do carry diseases, but the risk of them passing over to humans is very, very low. And the fifth claim is that pigeons destroy buildings and bring dirt. So here we arrive at what is probably the essential and most important claim and the ones that newspaper and media also chose to give front view. The fact is that pigeons fecal matter destroys building facades, which damages the image of the city and costs money to restore. Uh, now, within the debate, which was, was online, it's public on Facebook and it was over two hours, uh, citizens also uh, mentioned some of the arguments and the most often mentioned arguments by the citizens themselves, who the, the, the citizens who were in favor of the interdiction were related to economic, aesthetic and health related concerns. Um, and it's also important to, to think about the fact that this is really regarded related to the public space, but also to the center of the city. So the pigeons gather in the city center in the main plazas of of Timisoara and it is there where the, the buildings that the officials mostly care about are, are there. And these buildings are full of symbolic and cultural capital. They are based on a history of empire and on other histories that are important in the national imaginary and the, the imaginary of the city. Uh, just to mention, I want to say that Timisoara was called Little Vienna at the end of 19th century. So there are some buildings there from the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the damage that the fecal matter of the pigeons does to the building is stressed over and over. So in this imaginary, in this view of the city, the city is composed of historic buildings first and foremost, and it is they who must remain unchanged. The relations with pigeons are not seen as part of the city. But this is a point of conflict later on, because of course there were also arguments against. So the debate was uh, was started first of all because animal advocates uh, did not agree with these uh, modifications of the regulation and and wanted to contest them. And uh, I I I saw three things that mostly sprung up: three teams, the ethics, the methods, and the enjoy. So I will shortly explain each. The first argument, ethics has, it's kind of goes on two strands. 
So the first trend claims it is immoral and unethical to withdraw feeding and thus lead to possible starvation for pigeons and harm, thus leading in harming them. But the second strand claims it is inhumane to not feed and thus not be compassionate. It is a reprehensible act that humans should stand against. So both arguments have an ethical standpoint, but the first strand centers the pigeons and the repercussions upon them, while the second strand focuses on the humans. So in this case, the interdiction on pigeon feeding is not only withdrawing food from pigeons, but it's withdrawing a particular way of being and behaving from humans, a way that is seen as humane and compassionate. And someone even mentions that such an interdiction is against human dignity and against being humane in the public space. Now, the second reason people were really against the interdiction is because they do not agree with this method. Actually, both officials and animal advocates agree that some measures to control pigeon population should be taken, but they really disagree on the measures themselves. So the officials propose to begin with an interdiction and a fine, while the advocates propose educational campaigns and configurations that benefit pigeons. So the advocates claim that this modification only solves the effect, not the cause, and it is a punitive method. And the third reason uh, why people were against the interdiction is actually the fact that they see pigeon-human relationships as positive, as a source of joy. The argument of positive interactions between pigeons and humans is mentioned frequently, but is especially mentioned in regards to children and the elderly. So it's important to note that again, the human is centered as receiving benefits from this interaction with pigeons, especially in terms of mental well-being. But also the humans that are mentioned, children and the elderly, are largely absent from, from speaking in the debate itself. They are spoken for. So I also identified some of the things that, that both sides, so to say, really talked about often, but they did not agree on. So one of them, as I already said, is the issue of population management. And about agreed that a certain population size is too big, but they have different interests in mind. So the animal advocates have in mind the health of the pigeons first and foremost, uh, while the ones that want to do the interdiction seem to have in mind the aesthetics of the buildings. But so in theory, both should agree on building contraceptive pigeon houses as proposed by the animal advocates. However, in practice, the officials seem more interested in just having the pigeons taken away from the center and its buildings. So responsibility is a term that is really often mentioned in the debate by both sides. So while for animal advocates, responsibility seems to be about fostering ethical relationships with pigeons, for the officials, it seemed to mean mostly withdrawing improper feeding. So it's a non-interaction and a removal from the relationship. And welfare is used similarly. Both sides claim they are interested in pigeon welfare. However, from what I know, while the officials promised educational campaigns and pigeon houses, no such programs have been undertaken in the last five months since the law changed even though advocates from nonprofits would have done much of the work themselves. So I think it's here where there are limitations on just looking at this course and actual analysis should be done on what is actually undertaken. So a lot of this debate is about where the pigeons belong. Do they belong in nature or do they belong in so-called nature or do they belong in the urban space? And a lot of the debate is about how the city looks like. Uh, if the pigeons belong to the city. And many people seem to see it the way. So for example, you can see this quote from a man who spoke at the debate. He said, I was born and raised in Timisoara. Before 89, when I was a kid, the greatest joy was pigeons, not McDonald's. It's a, it's a really nice quote. It's full of nostalgia for another time, right? Like before the revolution in Romania, but it, it also has this really feeling of belonging that his own belonging is intermingled with the presence of pigeons. And pigeons seem to be belonging as well because he is belonging. So this, the same person later in the debate says the following, please find solutions. Don't starve or cast away the pigeons. Imagine a city without any living being, without any bird, only with historic buildings and a few people sat in the center, sitting at terraces and drinking alcohol. Um, so just to, to wrap up this presentation, I would like to, to say how I think vegan sociology can help in understanding this, this case. So first of all, what I think sociology does it, it helps us understand relations with pigeons as social and cultural relationships with a history 
So they are not given by so-called nature, they are made in relation and they can be changed. Uh, secondly, it's really important to see who holds the power of making and unmaking these relationships. And in this case, a lot of power is owned by certain humans, especially officials and property owners. But third, this does not mean that animal agencies should be ignored. Pigeons participate in their relationship with humans. They recognize uh, hum certain human faces. They can recognize a human who fits them from one who shoes them, for example. And lastly, I think vegan sociology can be a space to make claims for total liberation of humans and of humans. So in this case, we can look at cities as places of coexistence, refusing certain city imaginaries that are sanitized to the point of being solely spaces for capitalist consumption, right? How a center would look like that is just full of terraces and places for private consumption. And it's not so much even a public space anymore. And lastly, I think vegan sociology can claim veganism not just as a boycott, so not just as a practice, but an overall theory and political stance against the domination of non-human others and a way of stepping out of anthropocentrism. And to end with, uh, this is a photography from uh, taken at Sepale, which is the bird shelter in Timisoara. Uh, and they are already working on visions of coexistence. These are some projects they had at the bird camp, who was, which was an art camp held there, uh, where artists were invited to work in symbiosis with the place and the animals who reside there. So I just want to say that there, there are spaces of, of hope, I think, within the, this whole terrible mess. And that um, I think these sorts of ideas can show us that the projects for coexistence, they, they already exist, they are creative, they are ongoing, and they are multi-species. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, and we all love the pictures, by the way. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. Uh, we're, we're good. Again, we're going to save questions for the end. So if you guys want to go ahead and put the questions in the chat, and we'll come back to Maria. Uh, Brett, you ready to go? You're up next. Okay, I hope that's uh, visible. Um, Hi everyone, I'm Brett Mills from Centre for Human Animal Studies at Edgehill University in the UK. Uh, thanks to Zoe and Corey and everyone else involved in the organisation of this, of this conference, it's been great. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is an approach I'm calling banal speciesism. And in a moment I'll explain what I mean by that concept and then go on to show how I see it is useful for thinking about the, pr the profusion of ways in which speciesism takes place. But before that, I'll outline kind of a bit of my background and therefore the assumptions I'm bringing to these debates. My work is largely media studies. And so I'm interested in how animals are represented within culture. And from this, how those representations might have real world implications for those actual living beings. And it's within this context that I'm offering this framework that I'm calling banal speciesism. So what is this? I'm applying the ideas in Michael Billig's book, Banal Nationalism, which examines how nations structure themselves. And Billig's concept of banal nationalism concerns what he calls the daily reproduction of nations. That is the simple ways by which nations come to be seen as normal, natural, and inevitable. He argues that while nations are typically predicated on the idea that they are the logical way to organize societies, they instead only persist because there is what he calls a continual flagging or reminding of nationhood. One of the examples he uses for that flagging is literal, that is national flags that fly on public buildings such as government offices. But he also sees flagging as a process that works in less obvious ways, often simply by presenting the nation as obvious. Importantly for Billig, these themes of nation are widely diffused as common sense. The nation asserts it just is, and in doing so, it powerfully erases centuries of human history where the nation was not the dominant organizing principle for human societies. But the nation is now such common sense that suggestions of alternative forms of organization are usually understood as aberrant or unnatural. Finally, Billig is keen to make one significant point in his use of the word banal, where he says banal does not imply benign, that the nation comes into being through banal processes doesn't mean that its consequences are benign. 
Billig's book is an exploration of the implications of the existence of nations. And he posits war as one of the most obvious ways in which the existence of nations both leads to conflict and functions as the justification for it. So what's all this got to do with animals? My question here is what if we take Billig's argument and replace the word nation with species? Is it meaningful to posit uh, a comparable notion that we can call rather than banal nationalism, banal speciesism? What I mean by this is, how can we think about the ways in which, to again, to take Billings' quote, the daily reproduction of species takes place? Similarly, is it legitimate to suggest that there's a continual flagging or reminding of speciesood, that is, the state of belonging to a species? And finally, how are these themes of species widely diffused as common sense? And in asking these questions, I'm making the same assumption that Billig does, that the banal reproduction of the species category doesn't have benign consequences. Furthermore, it may be that the banal ways in which ideas of species are circulated that function of one, one of the most powerful discourses that animal advocacy movements must engage with. Fundamental to Billy's argument about how banal nationalism functions is his analysis of a usually unnoticed aspects of language. In particular, he examines how nations engage in the process of self-categorization and the supposed common sense nature of this. Now, nations sometimes engage in such self-categorization in explicit ways. Things like declarations of independence or national constitutions are ways in which what constitutes the nation and what the nation stands for is made explicit. But in aiming to look at the banal uh, enactments of this, Billig instead attends to smaller everyday forms of language in which that self-categorization is rendered natural through its straightforward expression. So a key thing that he's interested in uh, is banal language. And in particular, words like our, us, and we, and how, the, how these are used where there's no attempt to define who we are because it's natural and assumed. When politicians, for example, speak of our country or speak of us, they usually don't have to define or legitimize the boundaries of membership of that country. It's instead invoked as a common sense idea. They can just say our or us or we. But to say words like us is of course also to invoke an idea of its opposite, them. And so language serves to exclude as much as include. For Billig, nations regularly invoke ideas of inclusion and exclusion in ways that define the borders of the nation. And of course, once you define someone as them rather than us, you can change your relationship to them, prioritizing the needs of us over them. War, for example, can be understood as a process in which we kill them in order to protect that which is ours. What I want to suggest here is in the same way that Billy sees words such as us and them as powerful but banal demarcations of the nation, so the same occurs for species. Human cultures similarly employed words such as us and our to normalize the human as a category, and in doing so create a banal but powerful distinction that easily becomes a hierarchy. This flagging of the supposedly commonsensical nature of the human as a category is evident in the titles and subtitles of lots of books that discuss popular science, nature, history, and the world. As you can see from these examples, they repeatedly use the words our and we in their titles and subtitles to indicate an unarguable, natural, obvious notion of the group that can be called human. Of course, this elides differences within humans. These are Western books with Western approaches to thinking about the world. But there's no definition offered for the words we and our in these titles. It's assumed that the readers will straightforwardly understand their meaning. That these books come from fields including science, history and philosophy show the breadth of the spread of banal speciesism. Another example. The use of our has been evident in the title of the recent wildlife documentary series, Our Planet. This was released globally on Netflix in April of 2019, and the presenter, David Attenborough, is, of course, one of the most widely recognised and respected figures on wildlife documentary programming. However, his previous programmes, mostly made for the UK's BBC, have been criticised for their failure to engage with environmental 
environmental issues and our planet instead purported to have an avowedly environmental message and therefore asserted itself as a call to action. But what does it mean to call this planet our planet? This program could of course just be called this planet or a planet, but a particular relationship is understood by the commonsensical use of the word our. In a simplistic sense, our can simply see, mean a form of relationship, such as its use in phrases like our parents or our workplace. A reading such as this might see our planet mean nothing more than pointing towards the planet we live on. But our can also clearly point to ideas of ownership, as in the phrase our money or our bicycle. Ours is not yours, and this use of the term our asserts a right to access the resources that exist on the planet. Indeed, to see the things that exist on the planet as resources in the first place. This is ours, and so it's up to us what we do with it. Following this, our might be understood in terms of stewardship. And of course, it is this very idea that the vast majority of environmental thinking works from. It is our planet in that we have a responsibility and also a right to reshape it, even if this is done with benevolent motivations in mind. I actually think how our is used in our planet is quite fuzzy. It's a program that points towards the needs of non-human beings, but it does so via an appeal to us, where that us is humans, and I might add, Western humans whose technological capabilities and rationalist thinking are consistently assumed to be the best way to solve problems. While we might be generous and say that sometimes the hour here points to the modern human, we can be sure that at no point does it exclude the human. That is, the idea that other species or other beings or other ecosystems or other environments might want to claim that this is their planet is beyond comprehension here. So even if this even if this is, sorry, so even if this hour is larger than just human, that is always in addition to the pre-existing human category rather than a replacement for it. Perhaps one of the most banal ways in which anthropocentric language is normalized is through its absence. It's usual within media reporting of tragedies in which humans die for the fact that deaths being referred to are those of humans to not need to be marked and for deaths of animals to be absent. For example, the COVID-19 dashboard at the Johns Hopkins University is perhaps the most dominant and respected resource for figures relating to the virus. This screen grab is from yesterday and shows over 230 million cases worldwide and nearly 5 million deaths with supplementary figures for differing countries and regions. These cases and deaths are, of course, human only, despite the dashboard not indicating this. If you look, it says total deaths. It does not say total human deaths. The speciesism is so banal, it doesn't even need to be marked. It's assumed, we'll assume, these deaths are human only. Of course, though, it's not only humans that have died as a result of COVID. This BBC report tells of the 17 million mink slaughtered in Denmark for fear that they were carrying a mutation of the virus. The numbers of animals that have died as, as a result of efforts to tackle COVID far outstrip the number of humans dead, but you wouldn't know this from the Johns Hopkins dashboard. So whereas my previous examples pointed to the use of banal speciesist language, such as we and us, here the banal is evident by its absence, where the category of the human doesn't even need to be mentioned to be invoked. So how might we unpick this banal speciesism? Firstly, it's essential that banal terms such as we, they, us, them, our, and their be defined when they're used. Whenever anyone uses these words, they should be asked how they're using them and who's included and excluded by them. And I'm aware that the sentence I just said used both of the words them and their, so I'm not suggesting this is an easy thing to do. Secondly, the human must be made visible. And by this, I mean the word human rather than the category. The COVID-19 dashboard should say human deaths, not just deaths. The addition of the word human, where it's currently banally absent, would make the assumptions of human superiority, but also the human as a category, visible, and therefore trouble its assumed normalcy. And finally, and beyond the scope of this paper, I'll call back to my own field, media studies. It's a field that remains overwhelmingly anthropocentric, 
think many of us <laughs> have been saying this throughout the conference, uh, depending on what field you're in, despite its evident commitment, commitment to issues of power, justice and inclusion, it too engages in banal speciesism. The public of public service broadcasting is, of course, a solely human one. So I guess I'm calling here for a kind of multi-species media studies attentive to the banal ways in which media disseminate and normalize speciesism. So speciesism is one of the most powerful and problematic ways in which human hierarchies are upheld and a barrier to animal advocacy, welfare and justice. It's therefore important that attention is paid to the normalizing everyday unnoticed ways in which speciesism is enacted. Those ways that here I'm calling banal speciesism. Excellent. Thank you, Brett. Jeez. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, as animal scholars, we're, we have a general awareness of this, but when you start putting up all those book covers and, <laughs> and then even our planet, like, yeah, yeah. So hopefully folks have some interesting questions for Brett. We're going to come back to Brett after the rest of the panelists get to go. Um, I think, Jennifer, you're up next. Have you been able to give a shot at doing a presentation or do you want me to just go ahead and do it for you if you can just share i yeah that'd be great i didn't want to lose like zoom connection through messing with the technology thank you corey yeah corey good morning from america corey is graciously going to help me through the slides um and i just wanted to thank maria for the beautiful illustrations of the pigeons in the urban centers and and to um hopefully elicit Brett to send me some of this great work because I'm doing um, a theory of nationhood in Africa for lions and that uh, would really help me this presentation that was just done. So thank you both. Yeah, um, I'm doing this work now today, um, animal rights, legal personhood, non-human personhood and sentience. I'm not sure that this massive title will be the one that's eventually published, but um, it gives a straight picture to what's exactly happening here. And um, Samantha, my wonderful research fellow at Boston College, could not be here this morning, but she's been such a, um, a mover and shaker in this work. So I'm just grateful to acknowledge her and, um, and this great work we're doing. Um, so yeah, my name is Jennifer or Rebecca Shower, and I um, am going to talk to you a little bit this morning on what is happening with animal rights empirically. Corey, if you want to move to the intro slide. So I was um, doing teaching the past several years and always trying to talk about animal rights and, you know, my students were always saying like, what's actually happening? What's happening? And finally, I just was to, to the point this past spring where I'm like, I don't really know what is happening empirically. So um, Samantha and I decided, you know, to dig into this a little bit. And we have, you know, um, about five decades of thinking about animal rights. And, um, you know, we wanted to see like, what is the global sense of this? So if you wanna to move to the next slide, Corey, please. So yeah, the goal of the, the work here is just to say, um, to showcase what is um, happening internationally, what our country is doing in recognition of the different kinds of rights in the statuses. So we of course have Peter Singer's famous 1975 work on animal liberation that we're all so grateful for. But here we are, you know, in 2021, um, you know, five decades later, still thinking about how this theory is going to be actioned um, in, in our world, because we see more than anything and more than ever, as we just saw about the calling of the minks, um, suffrage. And so, you know, moving beyond suffrage, and, and we know that political standing is important for that. And so, you know, what, what is this theory in practice is, is kind of what we're asking in this paper. And also, you know, just thinking about um, David Pello's work and his book on total liberation on the animal rights and environmental movements. And that was in 2014, he published that. And we see in sociology, this real understanding of intersectionality and speciesism 
um, merging with sexism and racism and um, all the isms and all the prejudices, right? And so we see an expansion of Singer's work when we read Pello's work. Um, and um, so, but still yet, we ask the question, what are countries doing on the ground, right? Um, so yeah, Corey, if you wanna move to the next slide, thank you. So the, um, the methods are a snowball sample and we began with um, Marcus Freudendorfer's work in 2018, he wrote a paper called The Rediscovery of Indigenous Thought in the Modern Legal System, The Case of the Great Apes. And this is where um, Brazil's um, chimpanzee Cecilia is recognized as a legal person. And I'll get into her story in a little bit. Um, but basically, he talked here about um, moving into Amerindian thought paradigms, cosmology, and wisdom to understand how our prehistoric ancestors felt and shared space with other non-human beings. Um, before we, we came to this notion of anthropocentrism and the era of the Anthropocene, when there was a crossing of, of souls. The Egyptians didn't even have a word for animals until the Christian influence. So we see, you know, if we look back to indigenous cosmology and not just Amerindians Indians like Freudendorfer was talking about, but also um, all indigenous cultures globally, which has, has really become a paramount part of my research and all my teachings now in all my sections of every class, I include a section on indigenous cosmology because they have so much to offer our sociological world. And they are an underprivileged group of peoples that have recognized non-human species. So we have to really move into other realities non-Western realities to step outside of our own biases and understandings. And so the methods are the snowball sample of not only scholarship, such as, such as Freudendorfer's work, but also legislation, newspaper articles, um, and the legislation includes constitutions and laws. Um, if you wanna move this slide, Corey, thank you. So our data, this is just um, part of the table that includes the species, the non-human species. Our data um, began in 2008 and moved to 2020. We have 12 cases, um, four of which are rivers that have a legal standing. Um, the rivers are not showcased in this table the rivers are in Canada, New Zealand, and India. And those rivers claimed their legal distinction based on indigenous knowings and knowledges. So again, the importance I will emphasize throughout this talk of that prehistoric understanding of our relationship with non-human species, where there were not these clear and stark distinctions. Um, we have 10 countries that have granted statuses to non-humans. And again, there's a blurring in ancient wisdom of non-humans because um, indigenous folks, communities such as the Inca, they believed plants and mountains have energy and that energy is um, essential part of a being. So um, really thinking transboundary of what another living being is to different cultures and groups of people. Six of our cases we see um, have rights. Five of our cases have legal personhood. One case in Argentina has non-human personhood and one case in Portugal has sentience. So, you know, this is just a little bit of a display of, of what is happening empirically. 
Um, and I just wanted to bring our attention to the fact that the United States is not on here. Canada is in rivers, but that is only one occurrence. Europe is not on here. So, um, and Australia is not on here. New Zealand is in rivers. So let's just all of us here in this circle who are very open-minded and expansive, let's just think beyond, well, I say Europe, of course, and there's Portugal and Spain, but um, a different part of Europe, let's say that. Um, let's just bring our attention to the fact that we have underprivileged nations um, that are not always represented in our ivory tower spaces that are on this list, such as Colombia, India, Bolivia, and Ecuador especially. Um, so I just wanted to, to draw our attention to that. And as I'm saying that, I, I can see this being a part of, of our conclusions in the paper is to just really expand into these other um, countries and, and allow them to help inform this discourse and this conversation because they're doing exciting stuff with animals. And um, at times it feels a bit out of reach of, of what we're doing in the Western world. Corey, if you move to the next slide, please. So I'm gonna first talk about, there's only, other than that table, there's only three individuals um, that have been recognized with a legal um, standing. And I'm gonna talk about all three of these individuals. Um, and again, I wanna bring our attention to the fact that these three individuals are not in our Western world at all. Um, so Chucho the bear was in the Colombian zoo in Barranquilla and um, received legal personhood status in 2017, which is a fundamental right to liberty. Chucho's attorney was a law professor, a Colombian law professor. And he argued, quote, if fictitious legal entities such as corporations are subjects of rights, for what reason should those who are alive or are sentient beings not be so, unquote. So, you know, this quote really stood out to me and resonated because in the Western world, we see corporations as, as legal entities and yet our non-human sentient beings that we share this planet with are killed each and every day in torturous ways. And so just bringing this back to that, you know, capitalistic Anthropocene and what that has offered our world. Um, Corey, if you could move to the next slide, please. Um, uh, so this is Sandra the orangutan. She's 33 years old um, in, this, in this news article. She was granted legal personhood in Argentina and as a result actually um, relocated to Florida's Center for the Great Apes because in Argentina, there were no sanctuaries for orangutans. So she had to be relocated to a space where she felt community. She lived in captivity for 20 years in the Buenos Aires Zoo. Um, she was declared a non-human being, which was an unprecedented ruling, giving her basic rights and of life, freedom, and the promise of no harm, both physically and psychologically. And this was in 2015 that this ruling set stage. So she's just adorable eating her apple. Um, yeah, Corey, if you'll just click to the next, please. Thank you. So this is Cecilia the Chimp. In 2016, she is recognized as a legal person with rights. Formally, she was alone in captivity in the Mendoza Zoo. Now she's in a Brazilian sanctuary with the Great Ape 
project. So the ruling was in Argentina because that's where she was, but she was a, like um, Sandra, she was moved to a place where there was a sanctuary. Um, so, uh, you know, these three cases are the only empirical cases that I found, we found. Um, I wanted to, and there's a little bit of time before I get to my conclusion. So um, I don't know, Corey, if you wanna pick your, choose your favorite image of the three apes and um, we can just, or, or the three apes, the bear, <laughs> the bear. It's always like to my surprise that there's a bear and, and two apes. Uh, but these are the three empirical cases. And I was just gonna talk a little bit if there was time and, and there is on the distinctions between the, the four legal um, understandings um, of, of rights, which we kind of all categorize as rights. And um, again, we're using um, non-scholarly um, non work on this. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is rights. And here in our work, we had six cases. So there's two ways that rights have been talked about in, in our cases. And one is a really just general way, and it's from the Bolivian constitution in 2009. It refers to the rights of nature, where quote, ev everyone, both humans and non-humans deserve a healthy and protected and balanced environment, unquote. And this concept of rights includes um, ideas about protections and freedoms that should be granted, but it's really general. And I find at least in my previous work with um, jaguars and pumas in Costa Rica that, you know, jaguars have been protected since 1995, but that enforcement when the policies are vague and the laws and regulations are vague is, is the issue. So how are the um, laws enacted? And so, um, there's a bit of critique around the generalization, although it's so progressive. Um, then there's more specific rights, such as the Indian Supreme Court, and they've granted rights to all animals in 2014. And they declare that animals have five internationally recognized freedoms, range, ranging from the freedom from hunger to freedom from fear and distress, and pain and injury and disease. And that's Kanzel in 2016. And there are, um, so as you can see, India is really the most progressive and expansive out of all of our cases because they have a very specific law. And, and this really you know, goes back again to that, um, the traditions of Hinduism and Buddhism where um, you know, in Hinduism, we see with the deities, all so many animals. Pravati has Ganesha, who's her infant elephant. Um, we have um, Durga, who is a deity and she rides the tiger and she's really the warrior of all of the animals. And that's in Hinduism. In Buddhism, we see um, this oneness, right, where we see the Buddhist monks, the classic story of the Buddhist monks not even wanting to, to step on an earthworm, that all living beings are important. And we see also a lot of veganism in um, Buddhism. So, you know, we have to see beyond just like, why are these countries doing this? Well, there's a strong foundation in their traditional roots and lineages of wisdom. And I think this is really important. And this is where all my work and scholarship and, and even teachings is going. So I'll also talk about legal personhood. And again, there's really no single definition, but a little more general, but here we found the ability of non-humans to possess four characteristics, rights, power, immunity, and privilege. And, um, you know, that's, that's also a, a beautiful distinction, distinction. And again, we have to build a lot of momentum around these distinctions. And then the other two, I'll just briefly note because we only had one of each in our sample, non-human personhood, and that was in Argentina. And um, this is 
where non-humans are considered subjects rather than objects. So that move away from objectification. So still very important. Um, and then sentience in Portugal. Um, so the sentience has this legal distinction of noticing and recognizing non-humans ability to feel pain and suffering and have emotions and cognitive functions. So yeah, I'll just move into to our conclusions now. I think, you know, there's just a lot of conclusions, but um, I'm gonna just touch on four, four or five briefly. First, there's little diversity in the species, mainly it's great apes. We have one bear, and then we have more general clauses of all animals. So, you know, how can we move and expand other, other animals too? Um, very little information on enforcement. So I think that's kind of like future research, like what's happening. We have these laws from 2008 until now that are being enacted. It's like, what's happening? What's happening? Are organizations, do they even know of these policies, these laws? Are they moving these forward into the court system on behalf of the non-human voices? Um, I mentioned this, India has the strongest and most specific um, and then I think the last conclusion I'll just touch on that's most important is, is that reiteration um, of the, the lineage of the ancient traditions, indigenous, um, cultural, which is oftentimes religious in these countries. We see in the Middle East, Sufism has a very strong vegan component to them. They're radicalist fundamentalists, and they are of the Islamic sect. So we also see in some of these traditions, um, empowerment of feminine, of the feminine. So sometimes we see empowerment of animals and, and um, gender going hand in hand. And I think that's also an important aspect to consider. So just some thoughts moving away. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's all I'll say for now. Thank you all. And I'd be, I'm so happy to hear any feedback. Excellent, thank you. And thank you for, again, lovely pictures. So you remember what it's all about. Um, so yeah, please, if you guys can um, keep your questions coming on the q and I had to hold puppy, so she'd be quiet. So I took to scroll back and find some more questions. Um, but we do have one more presentation before we go to the Q&A. And that is Erica, if you are ready. I am, hopefully. Except, oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was really delighted to see the call for papers for this conference because I thought this will give me a really good excuse to talk about C. Wright Mills, who is one of my favorites, I have to say. And so I've got this kind of, it's a bit of a quote from Mills and then some, some big words that I'll talk about uh, fairly quickly. Um, okay, so here he is, the man that I often refer to with students as my academic boyfriend, because I've been <laughs> reading him and teaching him for literally decades. And the title for the paper comes from a quote from one of Mills's lesser known pieces of work. What the powerful call utopia is now in fact the condition for human survival. And I think as vegan sociologists, many of us could put our hands up to that. Um, and in the sociological imagination, which everybody here knows, of course, um, he suggests that the whole way we have of thinking about the world is inadequate to face the kinds of challenges that we have. Sebastian Moser calls Mills a thinker of epochal change, and that's the kind of main point that I want to make um, in this presentation, really. So we all know about Mills's massive sociological contribution. Um, one thing that we're very, as animal studies scholars, very well aware of is uh, the animal industrial complex, which is an idea that originates with Mills um, and his military industrial complex that he first outlined in 1956 in the power elite, which was, 
I think it's his best book, frankly, and it's a really radical book because it challenged the consensus, the academic polit political consensus at the time that the US was some kind of model of growth and prosperity and democracy and all this stuff. No, it's run by an elite um, uh, from these interlocking circles of business, the military and political leaders. We all know the sociological imagination. Um, and I think one of the things that it's very useful for us as critical animal scholars to pay attention to is actually the first chapter where he really rips in to the kind of sociology in the US of his time, that it was highly abstract, that it was highly conservative. And he argues really that it's pointless. If only he could have been to the BSA with me a few years ago, I think he would have, he would have felt <laughs> uh, everybody there should have been reading that because it was, much was pointless. What we needed, he said, was a public sociology with a moral purpose. And I think that's something else we can all put our hands up to too. Now, what sociology needs to do, Mills tells us in the sociological imagination, is to respond to urgent public issues. What was Mills's urgent public issues? There's all kinds of correspondence and letters and kind of concern, but Mills was not um, attentive to racial division in the United States um, and institutional racism and ethnic hierarchy. But what he was really attentive to was the possibility of nuclear Armageddon. And one of the things that nobody really reads of Mills <laughs> is The Causes of World War III, which was published in 1958. And what's interesting about this piece of work, I think, is that it enables us to read Mills as a sociologist of existential threat. Okay, so, we all know his idea of the industrial complex, but actually I think we could return to that a little because what Mills does in the power elite is that he's mapping the specific relationships between powerful American based corporations and members of military, economic and political elites and how those networks filter into policy making. And some of the insights of the power elite are so true today. Certainly he's pointing out the importance of oil, aircraft, military hardware, car manufacture, electrical and chemical companies. And certainly that's something we can think about in terms of environmental crisis. And he does look at food corporations. I was interested to see that they kind of disappear, but then they're all kind of combined in different sorts of uh, conglomerations. And of course, we're aware as animal scholars that this industrial complex notion was applied to other areas of social life and certainly innovatively by Barbara Nosk to the animal industrial complex. So just to remind us for Richard Twine, I think he provides uh, a detailed and useful definition, the animal industrial complex as a multiple set of networks and relationships between the corporate agricultural sector, government, public and private science with economic, cultural, social and effective dimensions. And in that paper of Richards, he looks at the relationships between livestock genetic corporations. Um, other scholars have focused on the way in which the media acts to legitimate, institutionalize, reproduce the animal industrial complex and the kind of hegemonic relations of meat and dairy consumption. And Mills had a lot to say about the role of the media in supporting the military industrial complex. But Mills is really very gloomy and I suggest we separate ourselves from him very strongly here. So for Mills writing in, in causes, in the expanded world of mechanically vivified communication, the individual becomes the spectator of everything but the human witness of nothing. He's terribly gloomy about the ability of people to intervene in terms of media and popular culture. Most human beings are cheerful robots. He says, we just go along with the oppressive relations of our time. 
Um, this picture, which I think is wonderful, is uh, Daniel Hellman in his alter ego, Sawyer the Drag Cow. And of course, if we weren't able to disrupt and engage with popular culture, and Daniel sees himself as a laughtivist activist in taking his vegan message um, through comedy and stand up. So we'll abandon Mills, I think, when it comes uh, to the reproduction of popular culture, because in Mills, there seems to be no way out there. Coming back to causes and seeing Mills as a theorist of existential threat, the reason why many people haven't read causes is because it's often dismissed within um, writing on sociological theory. So for Michael Burroway, you know, big cheese as he is, he talks about it as a pamphlet. He says it's not sociological and it's not really worth academic um, attention. But what Mills argues passionately in causes is that the structural imperatives of military industrial complex are pushing society towards nuclear destruction. So they are the kind of drift and thrust, if, if you like, towards nuclear war, which will be destru destructive of humanity and well, pretty much everything else as well. And he does talk about this sociologically. I think Burroway is wrong. So he talks about the military industrial complex as a socially generated system. He says it's planned and deliberate, but also it has the possibility um, to take us into an accidental nuclear war. And he has some very uh, prescient observations about the global impact of war economies, imperialist gambling for resources, which are even more obvious, I think, today than they were when Mills was writing in 1958. So when it comes to the climate, when it comes to the environment, and it comes to sociology, I think sociology has really failed to extend its imagination to the most pressing issue of our time. So in all the kind of well, what I would call mainstream literature within the sociology of climate change, I think probably one of the best is uh, the late John Urry. And he uses Mills actually in ways that um, I didn't realize until I went back to read Mills for this. So he talks about interlocking carbon interests or to quote him, what we might call the carbon military industrial complex. And like Mills, Ari says, we are facing catastrophe. Humanity is facing catastrophe and we have to come to terms with that sociologically. Now Ari's solution is let's displace economics by which he means neoliberal economics and to propose sociologically based solutions. But of course that begs the question, what sociology? And when you read the literature in the sociology of climate change, people like me just end up having to read things in hard copy because I keep throwing them on the floor. Where are the other animals? Where are our relationships with other species? But also how should we conceptualize the kind of existential threat that we actually face? So the Anthropocene, I do think it's a useful term, but I also think it's a deeply problematic term. Um, so Paul Crutzen, he's an atmospheric chemist, but he coins the term Anthropocene because he really gives a shit about global warming and wants to try and intervene and capture the public imagination around it. And all those ways in which humanity has written itself into the geolog geological record are those we associate with environmental catastrophe, population growth, overconsumption of fossil fuels, emission of greenhouse gases, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And he does also talk about species extinction. But of course, the problem with the Anthropocene is that it focuses on an imperiled planet. And the planet is going to be just fine. What's not going to be just fine is humanity and other mammalian species and many others besides. So there's the kind of, <laughs> it focuses on the planet rather than imperiled humanity and imper imperiled other species. 
I would say. And it also seems to assume that in this notion of the age of the human, that all humans are somehow equally responsible and as critical sociologists, of course, we can't have that. So what alternative conceptions have we got? Well, there's the capitalist scene, um, which I have a kind of love-hate relationship with, um, coined as far as I'm aware by Andreas Malm, as a way, and, and talking about capitalism as a global system which organizes natures of all kinds. Us, plant life, soils, other creatures. Um, Jason Moore calls it a complex system, which is, for some of you who know my work, I quite like complexity theory, so I like that. And Moore talks about how the capitalist scene involves historically the exploitation of cheap natures whether that's food, labor, and the laborers are not just human beings in this picture, energy, raw materials. We're coming to a crisis point where we're running out of cheap natures to exploit, and we're in an era, um, people like he and Malm would say, of desperate extractivism. I suppose I want to see more intersectionality. There's nothing about gender in the work of somebody like Moore. I quite like this notion of the plantation scene, which allows us to bring in alter colonial discourses. Um, but also, I want us to say more about our domination of other species and how this is bound up with the environmental crisis that we're in. So some of you know, I made up this word, Anthroparchy um, as a descriptor for human domination, which I saw as a complex system, and it has various degrees of oppression, exploitation, and marginalization of other beings and things that are non human. And I understood this systematically in terms of a, a sociological framework, and one that was intersectionalized. And I think our domination of other creatures and um, the living world really links very much to the concerns that we have as vegan sociologists. You all know these, these you know, this is kind of the stuff that I need to show at the BSA, uh, not at an event like this, of the billions of animals slaughtered, um, of the ways in which um, meat and dairy consumption and those conglomerates contribute to climate change and the loss of biodiversity. Um, and I think all these kinds of processes of human domination have to be understood as mediated through patriarchal, colonial, system systematic relationalities within the capitalist scene. So all those things are important. And I was very pleased to hear um, the P word mentioned uh, yesterday, patriarchy, and we've had the C word, capitalism, mentioned a few times today. So that's uh, all to the good, I think. So I wanted to finish with some of the words um, of Mills, really. So I think he would have, <laughs> although he was the son of a Texan rancher, although he experimented with disastrous recipes for beef and cheese stew. We can't kind of veganize Mills, but we can use um, some of his passion, some of his critique and some of his concepts. And one of the things he says in Causes is that if you do not alarm anyone morally, you will remain morally asleep. If you do not embody controversy, what you will say will inevitably be an acceptance of the drift to the coming hell. So it's kind of tub thumping stuff here, but I think it's something that we need to take on board. And this is the full quote from where the title comes. We're at a curious juncture in the history of human insanity. In the name of realism, men are quite mad. I don't mind him using men here, actually. And precisely what they call utopian is now the condition of human survival. Utopian action is survival action, realistic, sound, common sense, practical actions, like veganism, really, I thought, as soon as I, as soon as I read that. So I think we should take on board Mills's frustration with the sociology of his time. I think there's a lot to be frustrated with, with the sociology of our time. I do think 
things are changing, as Matthew and Kate suggested earlier this morning, but it's not changing anything like fast enough in a situation of existential crisis, which is what we face. So I think, I suppose the key question for us as scholars, and I would say the key question for all sociologists should be really, what ways of being human with others are going to enable the continuation of life on a damaged planet? Okay, well, that's it, thank you. Oh, well, spot on to have you finish out the conference with that uh, awesome and totally on topic talk about uh, C. Wright Mills. Definitely makes me excited to go revisit some of his work. Uh, so thank you very, very much for that. So I'm, I'm not going to lie, I got distracted by the talk and I haven't caught up with the questions as well as I could. So if there's any, uh, yes, if anybody has any new questions, I'm going to start with what um, some of the first ones that we got through. Um, <clears throat> Uh, actually, this one, I have one for Maria. Could you, could you maybe speak a little bit more to um, the imagery of empire that you've alluded to? And especially for those of us not very familiar with Romanian history, you know, as an American, that's not something that we were really taught. Um, it, it also seems when you're talking about the, you mentioned this kind of dystopia of having a pristine city with no animal life in it whatsoever, other than humans. Um, I've also seen there's recent research coming out about the civilization project as a, as a applied to human non human relations, and how this increasingly as we move into modern times, non human animals will either be removed or regulated and so it seems like pigeons now are sort of the, the final frontier of that kind of project so I, I guess that's kind of two different questions in there it would be nice to hear a little bit more about the Romanian um, history that that the bit on empire that you referenced, and then also this segue into perhaps how this re relates to the civilization project. Thank you. Uh, that Yes, it's exactly what I'm trying to look at, because I, I do feel this is a whole, it, it's exactly what you say, and it's it's working. So uh, they already, they, they interdicted this in New York, where Colin Jerolmack did this study, and it started like 100 years ago. And then uh, this interdiction appeared in, in London, also in Trafalgar Square, because of the Trafalgar Square pigeons, and in Venice, because of the pigeons in Piazza San Marco. And you can see the pigeons kept occupying these, these centers of the cities that were supposed to be lo looking really good and really touristic and be spaces of cultural consumption. So I, I, am, I am trying to look and for right now, I'm just looking at what happened now, but I think it would be important to, to maybe have an archival uh, view of exactly what, what, what was it with the pigeons uh, before this present moment. I want to share my screen to go back to this picture. Uh, you can see it, I think. Uh, so this is the, the, the main plaza in the center of Timisoara where pigeons gather and uh, in many, some of these buildings, many come go back to the Austro-Hungarian Empire that Romania was part of. Um, like in in uh, one, like one hundred years ago, let's just say it like that. And uh, what's really interesting also about this plaza, it's something that I'm really trying to figure out. But I think I need to. It's not there's no information online, but you can see a, a fountain, a tiny fountain on the ground near uh, just in the middle of the picture and then some newspapers said that fountain was for pigeons so therefore pigeons were at some point somebody imagined pigeons as really part of this architecture but i could not find when and and why this happened uh, lately however in the last 10 years there have been discussions of them being seen as social problems and and now i think i i my impression is that really with this Timisoara being a cultural capital of Europe, and with the new uh, the new party and the new mayorship, I think they're really trying to make everything more touristic and uh, more 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 uh, even civilized because there's whole this whole dirt discussion. So it's it's all going I think in this direction. But I I really I have this gap in which I need to look exactly at 
if if there was something going on with pigeons in the socialist period, uh, the socialist regime that fell in the 89, where the quote, the person, the man who was speaking said, oh, he was going to feed the pigeons before the 89, uh, where there was no McDonald's. There's a lot of reference to McDonald's in this whole pigeon, <laughs> pigeon issue also. Somebody said, um, no, no, the mayor, the mayor said something like, uh, I, I don't know why we should be protecting these birds that eat food from McDonald's, something like that. I found it amazing that he, they are not deserving to be protected because they eat fast food or what was the thinking behind that? So uh, there's a lot of, um, a lot of the interesting discourse. And then I, I also need really to look exactly at the practice of what pigeons actually need. Because the science is, is there's, it's very muddy. It's not very clear what is really best for pigeons. I've read things that are um, contradictory. And, and then people claim, they make claims and they say, well, this is science. And everybody just claims science as if science is magic. And whatever you say is science, then it's true. So I really need to, to look a lot more into that. And I'm sorry if my answer was long and, and not very good. <laughs> All it does is beg more questions. It's just really fascinating, all the, uh, the politics underneath. And I'm sure there's so much to unpack with the whole McDonald's bit as well. And yeah, and the, and the ownership of science and the politic politicization of it. Ugh. Thank you, awesome. Um, let's see, uh, Jennifer, you had your hand up. Do you wanna jump in? Yeah, I actually have a, or just a comment for Erica. You had a beautiful presentation, thank you. And I love the beginning where you're talking about Mills as your boyfriend, I love it, it's fun. Um, but before I get to Erica, I just wanted to comment to Maria cause she just sparked something and I have the floor, so I will. Um, so William Cronin is an um, environmental historian. He's quite famous here in America and he's at University of Wisconsin-Madison. And he wrote this, this chapter in his famous book, Trouble with Wilderness. And he, in that chapter says that civilization, he makes that dichotomy that civilization is tainted, is masculine, is um, corrupt, is dirty, is polluted. And the cities are that. And that, that was the, the move towards kind of this cowboy mentality and the frontier of the West. And when we explored the West and, and kind of um, domesticated the West and that, you know, femininity, and this goes back to ecofeminism, right? That femininity is nature and rural. And, um, and so there's like an impurity with the city, like this contamination with the city. And this is um, all over his writing and, and there's more than him. He's not the first one that said it. He's just the one that's coming to mind because I, I usually assign that chapter in most of my classes. And, um, and then how those particular animals such as pigeons like fit right into that, that kind of city contamination, like dirty, um, undervalued space because in and of itself, they're in the urban center. So I don't know. It's just like, I wanted to just bring up what he said and, you know, do what, what feels right, but like that there's people out there writing on kind of that, that differentiation between the two, but your work is so great, Maria. Thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, Erica, so um, I just had a comment. You asked a question at the end and this piece by um, Adrian Travis at University of Wisconsin-Madison, another Madison, I'm from Wisconsin, I'm a native Wisconsin. So I do know some of these scholars more. And this is serendipitous. She's an Egyptian goddess. Um, and she's gonna be, she's gonna be part of the show here. And you'd rather probably see her beautiful fur than me. So I'm gonna just keep talking with her there. Cause um, we like to give some autonomy to the non-humans in this household, don't we? Okay, so um, yeah, Adrian Travis, so he, is literally, I think maybe PhD by, I don't know, natural sciences. He runs the carnivore coexistence lab at University of Wisconsin-Madison. And as many of you know, I do work with jaguars and pumas and carnivores in particular. So he wrote this great piece after 30 years of being in science and kind of like the science of conservation. And he's like, this isn't where it's at. And, and he calls for what they call advocate trustees. And it's this very special kind of human, I would say many of us, that are empathetic, 
um, sensitive. I've brought in his work a lot with my work on sharing sentience that we have this kind of human, those of us that have it, have the capacity to understand animals um, where other humans don't. So almost like we are a different kind of human species, right? Because we, we um, don't have, let's just say the sensitivities or the, we, we have the sensitivities and we didn't, have not desensitized ourselves. That's the easy way to put it. But he calls these people advocate trustees and that in the legal system, they are the ones who should be the voice of non-human animals because they can see without the science. We, we can include the science, like Maria was being cynical of the science and I agree. Like we can include the science but that there's also an empathetic felt body wisdom that we know that that's wrong. It's wrong that we see an animal suffering. We don't need some scientist to tell us that animal is tortured and miserable. We can see it and feel it. And if we're empathetic, we feel the suffering so much that we're suffering with them. And Donna Haraway calls this shared suffering in her work on species meat, right? We, that, you know, and she's talking about confined feeding animal operations but, and, and lab animals. She's talking about lab animals. But the point is that, is that we feel them. And that's what Travis and colleagues are saying, that we, we know we are the people, these advocate trustees are the people that know the science, so probably academics and scholars, but we also feel them and we know their cognitive abilities and we don't need the science to say it. So it's like this kind of bringing together of all of our wisdom, what we call in academia, the subfield of traditional ecological knowledge, that there is an, it's like an indigenous knowledge, an indigenous empirical knowledge of, of knowing. And so that just like totally came to me when you asked your question at the end. So whatever that may mean for you, I hope it's helpful because um, it's exciting. Your question was like really provocative and I felt of passion and theory around it. So really nice work. Thanks, Jennifer. Erica, did you wanna respond really quickly? Cause we only have uh, six minutes left for, for questions. Um, yes, thanks for that, Jennifer. And I really enjoyed your paper too. And I'm kind of experimenting with some indigenous ways of thinking. I've got very interested in the pluriverse as a way of kind of decolonizing all kinds of, all kinds of things, including a, and Western conceptions. And I feel that I gave a very kind of straight Western <laughs> paper there. Um, so yes, thank you very much. And I'm gonna look this guy up, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Brett, there was lots of questions for you. It seems like you were answering them in the chat. I'm just gonna pick one that is a little bit more provocative if you wanna take the uh, last bit of time we have here before we go move on to our concluding remarks. So one of the questions here, Brett, was um, what do you think it would take to have a we that includes all animals? And also, how could we be mindful of the power relationships within this we animals? And I think you had a response in the chat, but I think this would be a good one to flesh out. Okay, I'm worried I'm not just gonna repeat what I put in the chat. Um, I mean, obviously there's been lots of kind of work broadening out that conceptualization of the we and, and, and as was noted in the chat you know there are other cultures within which we is more inclusive or fluid anyway so you know I'm, I'm talking about a particular kind of understanding and normalization of the use of the word we I, I as, as I've put in the chat I don't know that I kind of see the notion of we automatically always and forever including everybody and everything useful. And I, I guess I'm just thinking that linguistically, that there's a value sometimes, there's a usefulness. The word we has to sometimes mean an exclusion um, because if, if it means everything ever and includes everybody, we'll have to invent another word for the points when we're talking about groups that do exclude. Um, just in a very kind of pragmatic way. And I've kind of, you know, in the chat, I've given the rubbish example of we're going to the shops, that, that there's a value of the use of the word we there that, that by saying that I'm not implying every being on this planet is going to the shops with me. So, so it's that kind of fluidity that the, 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 this is why I kind of find the Billy banal idea important is because obviously what he's talking about is that these words are usually used with 
without any need to define them because the definition is understood as a common kind of sensical one. And instead it's kind of, I guess it's kind of acknowledging that that it's, I hate doing this linguistically, but, but it, it's noting those kind of words are verbs. And so we are houring and theming when we're doing that kind of thing. It's not a static kind of thing. It's a process that we engage in and we carry out when we, when we are doing it. Um, and so it's constantly kind of being attentive to that. Again, I'm aware that linguistically that's really problematic. There has to be a point at which you, there, will, there will be particular contexts within which it's le legitimate to use the word we in an exclusionary way and that's fine, otherwise we're constantly tripping over ourselves in language. But where that language is used um, in some of the examples that I kind of gave, that is problematic because it normalizes particular regimes of consideration and deaths is a very noticeable one. You see this all the time. I think uh, in some ways, I think the better example is after um, environmental disasters where deaths are, and you know, in Europe, there's been floods recently in, in Germany and Belgium and so on. And the newspapers constantly reported the numbers of deaths, but what they meant was human deaths. And there were plenty of animals that, that died in those floods too which I did see reported in some papers, but obviously that sets up a regime of consideration that these deaths matter and these other ones don't. So I think it's being attentive to it, but they say at the same time, I'm aware that, that once you start calling people out on words like we and them and ours all the time, then language falls apart. Now, maybe that's a good idea. And maybe that's a thing that's, that's productive to do. And obviously a lot of the work that, that we do is critiquing the normalization of language, but, but I don't know that I'm arguing it has to entirely disappear. Instead, it's, it's, I don't know, maybe there's another word that we need to develop or whether it's we with a small W and a capital W, whether that makes a difference. Um, and so it's thinking about those terms and it's, yeah, it's acknowledging that those things are processes rather than static kind of things. Thanks, it's a shame Roger, I think Roger has left the, the panel, but he's always a big fan of troubling language. There's never any easy solution, and it's always fun to get folks together and start trying to hash it out. So thanks for that, Brett. Cool. Well, we'll end it on a positive note there. Some critical thinking and some food for thought. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to have to bounce out of the meeting in order to actually push stop recording.